Okay. So today we're going to be talking about uh, metaprogramming. It's our first chapter in metaprogramming. Um, so we have a little bit of the intro and then most of the big picture. And the big picture really covers the basics of each part of the following three chapters. So there is a bit of the following three chapters kind of sprinkled in. Um, yeah, so there is no exercises in this one too. So it, it's kind of a little bit lighter on code I felt than uh, some of the other weeks, um, but was interesting to, to read. Uh, and I, I wonder what your thoughts are at the end. There we go. <clears throat> so outline, we're gonna go through what is metaprogramming, then talk about the fact that code is data and can also be a tree. Um, I got to use the emoji uh, package for this, so I was very happy. Um, evaluation of code and then an intro to quotures, which is going to be chapter 20, I think. So um, just a little bit of everything, really, that we're going to see through the following uh, section of this book. So prerequisites, uh, we're using our Lang uh, mostly for this, and then Lobster again to look at structure. Uh, I put a beautiful picture of an albino Nova Scotian lobster. I'm from Nova Scotia in Canada, so I thought you guys would like that. Um, and the reason why we use our Lang is it has essentially a bunch of user-friendly and tidy, um, tidy-friendly versions of the methods that you would use for metaprogramming. It seems like uh, in his his kind of uh, archaeology and research into metaprogramming in R. Hadley's found that there's a lot of inconsistency and ambiguity in the way that it's done outside of the tidy system. So in designing the tidy system for this, it's mostly to make it easier for us. Uh, so he leans heavily on that and uh, kind of we'll see that theme throughout this chapter and throughout the rest of the, of the um, section. So what is metaprogramming? Well, the basic idea is that um, code is data and can be inspected and modified programmatically. Um, <clears throat> so this is that essentially um, the code you have until it's been evaluated or run, um, it can be treated as any other kind of object that you might have. Uh, and in that sense, you can do things to it um, in ways that will make it more useful for you uh, and more adaptable and flexible to other applications uh, within your system. So one good example um, that's like we just take for granted is that you don't have to put quotes uh, on package names in library. It just knows that it should be quoted whatever you put in there as text, right? So um, that's one example or in GLM where you can um, have formulas that string along those formulas and the way that that architecture works is also an, an example of where you have a piece of code that you've written, but until it actually gets run, that's not, it doesn't, you know, that code itself um, is, is modified internally to provide you with the data structure that's needed to actually figure out what a GLM is, you know, to actually fit your model. Uh, and we're going to focus on tidy eval rather than base eval to avoid some of the ambiguity in the legacy code. Um, we see this come up again and again and again. And I want to say quotures is the is a whole chapter basically dedicated to this because that's a different concept that doesn't exist in, in base R. <clears throat> so he starts off by mentioning non-standard programming. And non-standard programming, well, it's definitely it's being able to programmatically modify an expression or its meaning after it's issued, but before it's executed. So once you've written the code out but before you've actually run the code. So that intermediate, intermediate period of time and not uh, in a way that's like, oh, I'm going to go back and edit my code, but in a way that's uh, programmatic and, and can be done um, you know, within your code itself. Uh, an example, another example, I guess, is uh, how you can do subsetting uh, in this example here, where you have horsepower is greater than 250, and you don't have to say that it's the MT cars object um, within um, your subset function. It knows to link that back to MT cars. So internally, it's saying, okay, give me my give me my data frame, and then for 
the variable whose name is uh, um, HP find you know filter on that. So you don't have to do it the traditional way where you have to write out both uh, you know to get the correct index you have to write out empty cars uh, HP is greater than 250. So it, it's kind of smart like that. Um, Hadley opines that uh, NSE is a sloppy uh, definition for this behavior um, because you're talking about something that's not standard when we don't have a clear picture of what standard is um, and it's not really used all the time the same way. Uh, so we're going to avoid this terminology. So I just taught you something for nothing, but uh, you may see it somewhere else in your um, your programming time. And uh, R is one of the few languages that has as much flexibility um, and accessibility for non-standard uh, programming. Uh, and Python's jealous of this. Uh, I saw some some Stack Overflows that were talking about how uh, NSE and and they're like, I can't believe that R can do all of this. I wish that we had this in Python. So. Everyone rejoice that uh, we're, you know, they're jealous of us in this, this case. <clears throat> and then lastly, you know, what's the motivation for metaprogramming? <clears throat> well, the ability to modify the meaning of code given context and inputs is extremely powerful. You know, the abil ability to understand what it is, the code that you have, and then interpret it in different ways when the context is different is, is yeah, it's powerful. And, um, it unlocks a lot of the interesting features in Tidyverse. A lot of the functionality in Tidyverse is built off of the idea of metaprogramming. And since R does it by design, we should use its full power. Obviously, more power is, uh, is, is always good. And so we should be like Captain Kirk and request more power. <clears throat> so then I guess the first real um, topic, you know, first actual bit of code that we're going to have is uh, expressions. So. It's essentially expressions are uh, when you capture code uh, and you can compute on code as if it were any other type of data. So uh, a captured piece of code is, uh, is an expression. And uh, in our lang, you use the um, expr function. And so basically what it does is it takes the code that you have and um, it just holds it in place, okay? It doesn't, essentially it has the captured code. It does not run that code. But if you were to evaluate it, which we later will, um, it's basically built to be evaluated, okay? And there are four types, and these will all come back up in later chapters, so you don't need to memorize them or understand uh, deeply what they are. Calls, which represent captured functions, which would be the example we have above here. Symbols, which would be the names of objects. So in that example, X would be a symbol. Uh, scalar constant, so that's, uh, basically any number. So if it was like, you know, uh, if you had some some number multiplied by something in here, that would be a, a scalar constant. And then pair lists, which is essentially, th they're less important, but it's a legacy version of lists that uh, is used to store the arguments of functions. So um, I would worry less about those, but the three main things that we'll be using throughout these chapters is, is the calls, symbols, and uh, scalars. And um, when we capture that code, it's all well and good, but you can only do that in this example, if I were to go back, like directly from code that you've typed, it doesn't uh, work within a function. So more often than not, you want that case like the GLM where you have written out the function inside, or sorry, yeah, you've written out the terms of your, um, of your model inside a function, and that's not gonna work in this circumstance. So. What we need to do is we need to use the enriched version. Um, <clears throat> so if we were to use this example here, capture it um, is a function of x. And if we were to run expressions on, or, uh, yeah, on it, it's just going to return back x. It doesn't understand that you want to actually capture a plus b plus c. But if you use the enriched version, um, it does lazy, like where you want lazy evaluation, it's going to give you back a plus b plus c. So really all I need to know is, if it's gonna be inside a function, you need to use the enriched version, right? Um, if you're gonna be passing it through with lazy evaluation. <clears throat> and once we've captured that data, we can inspect and modify it um, just like you would any other piece of, uh, or any other object you have. So uh, in this case, we've got a function and it has two inputs, X is one and Y is two. Uh, if we were to look at the second element of this, it's going to be one, which is to say X is one. And um, the first element of this would actually be 
um, f itself, so the function, uh, it, it does the function as is the first spot, and then it has each subsequent um, input uh, as the subsequent parts in the list. And uh, if you were, you can call it by its name as well. And then modification, you can actually add additional things. So um, you can make changes and you can inspect. So I mean, you can do all the stuff we would do normally with data. I'm not totally certain when I would do this directly like this, but I could see in some um, inside some functions, maybe there are some circumstances where you're uh, modifying different uh, functions to add pieces to it, um, given certain defaults. That might be something that happens. <clears throat> we can also look at code as a tree, um, and it's usually called an abstract syntax tree. And to view those, we use the lobster package uh, AST, and it just displays the underlying tree structure. This is kind of like what we saw before, um, where we were looking at the the naming and the nesting of, of things within uh, using the lobster functions, or sorry, lobster package previously. But in this case, you know, using the same kind of drawing, um, we can see that for a function of A and B, well, it knows that um, it has the kind of the branches here are going to be the functions, and then the leaves on those branches are going to be uh, the symbols and constants themselves. And so in the, the case on the bottom, um, it actually preserves kind of the bed mass uh, kind of rules here, which is cool. So it will, you know, it'll apply the multiplication first and then the addition, uh, since it's, that's the way it's nested, which I thought was kind of an interesting um, part to this. But yeah, it's, um, so it, it understands how to use these functions properly, which is, is, is pretty cool. Uh, but it, yeah, and it also works with prefix form, um, which is, is nice. So this is a good way to kind of look under the hood if you want to understand um, kind of the how your, your code is working. We can also generate code, uh, which all of these kind of things we'll be talking about more. The, the structure, I believe, is chapter 18, where they're going to do a lot of abstract syntax trees. Uh, it's either 18 or 19. And um, yeah, but we can actually generate code um, from pieces of code which is kind of cool. So not just inspecting and modifying, we can, we can make code from other code. And uh, there's two ways to do this. Uh, call to, which is kind of the manual direct way. Um, and so in this, you can kind of construct code from other pieces of code. So here you have the function first, and then we have um, the two elements for it. And so call to will stick them together. Uh, and then you could kind of um, nest those in on each other. But when you nest them, I mean, this gets complicated very fast, as you can see. Like, I don't personally find it easy to read that second uh, example there. It's it's somewhat cumbersome and complicated. And if you're trying to do this more programmatically or consistently, you would likely not use a system of this sort. So what we can do is we can use the bang bang operator. Um, and so because of that cumbersomeness, you really don't want to be building really long strings, uh, you know, like uh, function calls that have multiple call twos inside each other. Uh, so a simpler way to do that is to use the unquoting operator, which is the bang bang, which essentially does the opposite of capturing. It's, um, yeah, so capturing, another term for that would be quoting, and to unquote is uh, is the opposite of that, which basically it runs a section of the code, um, but it doesn't really run it because it's immediately captured again. So it essentially like uncaptures it to, to be set somewhere and then to be recaptured. It's a little confusing, but luckily we have like an entire chapter about this. So you just have to understand the basics that, um, that the unquote operator uh, is used in that way. And, the cool way you can use it is that you can more programmatically design um, ASTs uh, from a template of, of simpler ones. So you can kind of take multiple simple ones and kind of Voltron your way into complex ASTs. Uh, and so in this case here, the very simple case, um, we have two expressions, you know, X plus X and Y plus Y, and we want to have an expression of them uh, one fraction over the other. And so we can do that by using the bang bang operator where it unquotes the expression um, x plus x and the expression y plus y and then quotes it again all together. Okay. 
And the cool thing is that no matter what you change x and x and y to y to, they're going to, you know, like that bottom expression is agnostic to what those top two are. So the formula in the bottom can always stay the same. And you might want to change things on the top, you know, of the two xx and yy, which we can see better in um, a functional form. So now if we use uh, an enriched version, right? Um, we can use this in a function. And so we can create our own um, covariance function here. And basically we're gonna pass in what we have our, as our variance object or our variance expression. And uh, well, it's an expression, yeah, our variance expression. And then we're going to grab that variance um, code, make sure, capture as an expression. That's gonna be your second line here. And then we're gonna unquote the expression and put it in both the, the places it needs to be to calculate the um, cross-validation. And if we were to look at the expression we get back, it just comes out um, <clears throat> as x plus y when you run uh, CV of x plus y. So it's going to be the standard deviation of x plus y divided by the mean of that. So it's pretty cool. It, it's The CV code is agnostic to what you write into the um, actual function, and then the function runs by itself. And it gives you back an expression that you can then, <clears throat> you can then evaluate. So we'll further talk about that, but you can set it up so it runs off. Of, you know, you basically have created the code here to be run later. And um, capturing and uncapturing, or sorry, quoting and unquoting, is uh, together make up quasi quotation, which I think is chapter twenty. And um, <clears throat> quasi quotation makes it easy to create functions that combine um, code written by the author uh, as well as by the user. So that's like, uh, you know, again, that GLM example, you know, the formula you write out, that is being mixed in with code that's written by the authors of GLM so that you can actually get all the data set up for your, um, your model matrix and give you the outputs that you want. So I think this is like a very user-friendly thing. Uh, if you are just an analyst, I don't see how this is that useful for you, but if you are building something programmatically for others, this is definitely something that uh, is powerful. <clears throat> so we've built, uh, you know, we've, we've looked at all these different ways where you can create, uh, modify, inspect, combine, generate uh, code, which is all well and good. But at some point in time, we have to run it. That is, uh, that is generally what we're trying to do here. And uh, so to do that, we can just use the base function eval. And um, it relies on an expression and, as well as an environment um, to give kind of the symbols you have definition. In that past example where we had um, our CV function and we had x plus y, we hadn't defined what x plus y or x or y were. So realistically, like it has no idea what those are. And um, in my blank environment, it would you know it'd say like I don't know what x is or I don't know what y is. So it's not going to run. Uh, so for here, we have to either we have to define the environment. Now, if you already had in your uh, in your environment those variables um, named, then it's going to look like it, it looks in your environment after it can't find them in the environment that you provide. Uh, it's not uh, completely close. So in this case, I just provided a couple of um, <coughs> strings of uh, random normals of thousand long. And we get back the cross validation of them added to each other. And so one advantage of evaluating code manually is that you can kind of, you can define the environment that you're going to do this with rather than um, having it at runtime. You can, you can say, I want to evaluate this when I want to evaluate it and with what data. And this can, you can do a couple of things. You can override the way some functions work um, just temporarily. Uh, like we'll see in an example in a minute, you might want to change the way plus works, uh, or you can add a data mask. And uh, data masks are, are, are not um, masks that we wear now with cool math nerd stuff on them. Uh, they are in fact um, environments, uh, well, they are somewhat environments and they're somewhat data frames that contain um, user supplied objects. And those objects in the mask kind of, ha they, they have precedence over the environment itself. Um, and I, you know, they mask the objects that you had in your environment. And so in the kind of the example above, I've somewhat made a data mask in the way that I provided those two P 
pieces of information rather than having them be run from my um, from my local environment. But uh, as we'll get to later on, and it's a big part of, uh, uh, I can't remember which chapter it is, either 19 or 20. Um, this is a big part of, of, of the power behind um, tidy eval uh, is, is using data masks because you can essentially just override um, the environment when you need to rather than um, all the time have basically pushing new pieces of information uh, into your environment. Uh, and so <clears throat> this is that example that I was saying where we can create custom functions. So on evaluate or at evaluation in our environment, we can create um, different, basically like different interpretations of functions that exist. So maybe you want uh, to use a different, like select being something else for you than it does in the deep fire case. And then you want to have that only in this one particular environment and not screw everything else up for the person. If that's a circumstance that you're looking to do or plus in the case of ggplot, um, in those circumstances, you can override that functionality temporarily. And so uh, in this example that I updated a little bit from uh, what Hadley had given us, um, we're taking those random vectors that I had. Um, well, actually, sorry, the example with the random vectors is that we've adjusted their, their names uh, in the environment. We can also adjust the names of functions. And so this is what we're doing here. Uh, so he's changed plus to be um, just concatenate the two strings together. Uh, minus in my case is if you have, if the ver if the second thing exists in the first thing, remove it. Uh, so turn take all those away. And then uh, the last one is multiply the two things together, which is uh, basically repeat the first string as many times as the second string or the second uh, variable y comes in. And so um, he uses first the environment uh, uses the environment it came from, and then it makes those adjustments to it. So it changes those functions. And uh, then string math is evaluating the uh, whatever it is that you had as your expression, but using the environment that we've defined here, e. OK? So um, I create a variable what, and I call it power, and I do string, string math on more plus what, and it gives us more power. And uh, then do string math on this example with uh, x minus, or sorry, x, y, z minus y times 3, and we get uh, xz, xz, xz. So it's kind of cool uh, that you can do these sort of things. But if we had to find this in, um, if we had to find this in our local environment, this is going to cause chaos because now plus is not what we wanted plus to be. And uh, I'm sure you could see how that might be more problematic. And the same circumstance, you know, like this, this comes up with uh, definitely ggplot plus is where I'm seeing this as being an applicable, um, uh, an applicable thing to do. And the last one is you could, as we're talking about, is the uh, data mask idea, um, which is kind of, you can customize what data you have in your environment rather than what functions you have in your environment. Um, and here is essentially we can, what we care about for the data is not the, the data that it comes from, but is a piece of data that we're um, interested in interpreting and overriding the data what is actually in our local environment just for a temporary, uh, period of time. And so um, the first thing he says about this, and I'm, it comes up again in the evaluation chapter, which is their 19 or 20. And um, basically there's some, he, he uses eval for part of it, but then he switches to eval tidy, uh, which is a different function, which is from R lang rather than the base one. And the main reason why he does that um, is that eval tidy uh, takes a data mask as well as your expression and environment. Uh, and then what we're going to talk about in a minute, it takes closures as well uh, as, a, as a particular object um, with your data mask. To, and, and this is essentially to reduce ambiguity. Because what can happen with regular eval is you can provide a data mask in an environment. And it doesn't know, like if, if both your environment and your data mask have the same variable x in them, um, you don't have certainty where, which, which one it's using, if it's using X from your environment or your data mask when you provide both of them. So um, there's ambiguity there and there can be other ambiguity that kind of pops up. So using tidy eval um, removes that altogether. Uh, so I, this is kind of his main motivation for using it. Um, so uh, the toy example we have here 
is we have a data frame of, of values of, that are X, which is one to five and Y is just five ones. And we want to uh, evaluate this and, uh, expression that's X plus Y, and we're gonna use the data mask DF. So that's the second, um, the second position here in our uh, tidy eval function. And then uh, we have an environment that's actually defining X as 11 through 15. And because we're using a data mask, it overrides or masks the values of the environment. So we get back the values two through six rather than getting back um, 12 through 16. So this is a little bit amb ambiguous, right? Like if you didn't know that the data mask is going to override it, you might be one to think that maybe I should get the opposite back from that second call. Um, so tidy eval um, makes it you know, even more uh, programmer proof by using the two pronouns dot data and dot environment um, that we can use within our expressions. And so if I wanted to make sure I was using the environments X rather than the uh, data masks X, I could just put that in there and that's the second expression. So now I get 12 through 16. So um, it seems like most often we should be using eval tidy and it's more just like the the lazy kind of quick ways when we'll just use regular eval um, or ones that are more built with the base data. But from reading around the other chapters to kind of understand this, it seems like by the end of each chapter, they're pushing us towards the tidy eval version. So eval tidy is gonna probably be our main tool um, when it comes to evaluation. So the last thing we have is, uh, is quotures and uh, Essentially, the, the issue we might have is that um, without a quotient, we don't have, uh, essentially, we don't have a requirement that the environment, the, like there's, there's no requirement on the environment when uh, we do evaluation. And so in this example we have here, we have a function and we've written it so that a constant is assigned within the function. Um, and then we're evaluating the expression. Uh, that we're given with the data mask as well. And so um, when we actually run this function and the expression we give it is uh, with our data mask, um, which gives our values X, we would like to know X plus A. And we, we feel like we've defined A as 10, but we've actually, A is set in the environment of the function to be a thousand. So it doesn't know that the A exists outside that environment uh, as being the one to take. So, it says, okay, well, I'm going to give you back what I think the value is instead. So this is, uh, this is a problem for a user. Now, you, if you wrote all this code, you might understand why, and you, you know, that's all well and good, but this is, like, I think, to kind of make it easier and more user-friendly. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to take the environment that we're currently in and bind that with the expression that we have so that we have kind of a, a more uh, well-understood um, construct of intent. Like what is the intent that the user had when they made this? And um, so we use this thing called a quotient, which is just bundling that expression and environment together. And it's a portmanteau uh, of um, quoting the, and closure uh, because you're, um, it's a, uh, a closure, so it quotes the expression and encloses the environment. Um, and uh, closures, they, they solidify that uh, chapter six, um, concept of the internal promise object into something that you can program with. So it, it essentially takes that idea that we knew, which was like, we have this thing that we're going to evaluate and here's the environment it was in, but now it's like all stuck together and you can't, you know, um, you, you can't get rid of it, right? Um, so rather having it be that nebulous case where maybe you're, uh, um, you know, you, you haven't had a talk with your significant other yet, what you are, you've had that talk in this circumstance, everything's solidified together. Um, yeah, so that's the, the basics of closures. And uh, if we were to run that, um, that example again, um, with n quo, so now we're, we're using quo, if we go back instead of express, um, it's taken in the environment that we had, a is just the same a as before, since the code's run in line. And now it gives us the correct results, 11, 12, 13, okay? And uh, you can't use quotients with um, base eval. It is a concept that's designed by the tidyverse. So 
we have to use uh, closures replace your expression and your environment within eval tidy. Uh, so you don't need to provide those, those either way uh, anymore. And you end up kind of with a recipe where you provide uh, closure and um, uh, data mask. And that's essentially what you're going to provide for a lot of circumstances. Um, and they say that, th they, I think they're a little more strict in their statements where they say that like you should always use uh, a data mask, um, or sorry, when using a data mask, you should always use a quotient. But um, in the examples they have preceding this, they don't do that. So it's kind of confusing. Uh, but that's what they're saying. And so I'll say it's best practice to do so, especially because essentially e eval tidy is designed that way. Uh, so that's the totality of it. But uh, kind of how this links to the rest of the chapters. Uh, well, metaprogramming, you know, it lets us modify code after definition and before evaluation. So that's really the key here and why we want to use it is that um, that linkage between um, kind of input, which could be by a user and modification, which can be by a kind of a, 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 um, a code author, right? So that's that to me is kind of where it is, is that you can you can make things user friendly as much as possible to the user, like the library case of not including quotes. Uh, but then on the back end, you know, the the author of the code kind of modifies it as it needs to be to work with the rest of the code. And then um, kind of the three chapters, there's four chapters in this section left. And uh, the first three of them kind of repeat a lot of this stuff in much more detail. Um, captured code uh, is expressions and uh, they act like data. So that's all of chapter 18. So that gives us our, our trees and um, talking about capturing code. And then quasi quotation, so that's that quoting and unquoting. That's the that after capturing, it's the it's kind of the capturing and uncapturing part, and how we can use that to interactively generate code. That's chapter 19. And then the evaluation, uh, which allows customization depending on the data masks you have and the way you change some functions uh, and the environment you set. That's all chapter 20, and that talks about quotures um, and gets into great detail about how to use uh, eval tidy properly. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Good stuff. There weren't any questions, or sorry, any um, exercises for us to get frustrated with. So I feel like this week we got off a little easy. Yeah, nice job. That was awesome, Josh. Um, I just had a question about one of the examples you were going over. Um, sure. But I don't actually remember my exact question, but I remember what the slide looks like. So okay. if you go back like a few slides, like I'll tell you when to stop. Um, I thought I remembered, or maybe <laughs> I thought I remember what the slide looks like. But, uh, uh, could you go well, one more time to the right? Sorry. Uh, yeah. What was it about? Do you think? Um, it was like a case where uh, I think. Okay, I kind of remember. I think it's like the um, an example where you you were expecting to have it reference like X that was in the environment that you created, like, or you, that you defined within the uh, evaluate call, but then it actually uh, took X from the, da the data frame, I think, or something. Oh, uh, um, that would be, yeah, here. So yeah, that one. Yeah, yes, yes. yes. So, um, so tidy eval defaults to using the mask rather than the environment. So I don't think anyone oh. would actually ever um, write it this way. Uh, I'm sorry, this example is, is, is deviating a little bit from what they had. Um, yeah, I don't think anyone would actually write out an environment like this, but this was just because I didn't have an X defined. So you could, you could guess that this X was kind of in previously called somewhere. Um, but yeah, so what happens is uh, eval tidy looks and it says, okay, I have an X from my data mask. And so 
uh, I'm not going to use the X that's provided in the environment. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, if we were using a quotient instead, we would kind of have had this environment and this expression inside the quotient, and then use those instead. But it would still use the data mask and uh, override that. Mm -hmm. But we can um, we could be explicit rather than implicit, and we can use dot env, which makes sure that you're using the environment um, right. values rather than the data values. I'm going to guess that this will spit an error if uh, if x is not defined in the environment, though. So, right, I, I, I and, and that's that yeah. sorry, and and that environment that it's referencing with the dot env. That's whatever you pass as an argument to this last slot, right? This environment slot, like like that yeah. won't look in your global environment, right? Uh, I like think if you does. didn't have that last one. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I think it will. Um, oh, okay. Because I think it. I, uh, hmm. It's hard to say when I provide an environment, but if I didn't provide an environment altogether, I think it it assumes your. Um, your environment, like it basically, it's going to grab a, a version of your current environment and then mm. provide the mask on top of it. Got it. That's got that's it. at least how I I think it was it worked. But we can, I mean, yeah, I can try and pull it up and see. Um, I just took a look. I just checked the documentation for eval tidy just to see, yeah. and it looks like the default value for env is caller env. So it'll like plug in as that environment uh, okay. function was the but if, environment. If you provide an environment though, it will explicitly override that you think, or? Yeah, well, uh, I th th that's what I assume based on just... like, I'll show you, I'll send this. Thing. Cool. I I'm not I sure. Bet, yeah, it makes sense, yeah. <laughs> it definitely uses the default X because I just got a string of a thousand back when I, uh, when I ran it quickly on my machine. Cool. Um, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, it definitely it uses the default after the, um, if you don't provide it. So this seems a little dangerous to me. I, I, I don't know when I would, would, would use it, but I would probably specify dot data if I had to. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I think we'll learn more about why and how, uh, to use these. Uh, yeah, one comment I have is that this chapter seemed like it was telling half the story of everything that we would need in the future chapters. And then I tried to read some of the future chapter parts and found that I was like, like he makes kind of offhand comments on something like, you know, why you might use t eval tidy. And then I had to like search through the entire chapter to find out where that was. Um, but they don't look that complicated, which kind of is, was, a, I think we were talking about this last week where it's de demystifying the idea of object oriented coding. I feel like this is going to be demystified quite easily through these chapters. Um, and then chapter 21 is like a basically like a, a use case of how to apply it to uh, LaTeX and HTML, which is a, seems a little out of place. But um, yeah, I know, it, 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 it seems like an interesting section, at least. Yeah, um, I had a question going off of that, or a comment going off of that, or I guess a question to comment. Um, uh, Josh, at some point, also you said, uh, like, you think that this kind of, I think it was like a general comment, um, that, like meta programming, maybe in general, like, seems like it's something you would do if you're building something for someone else, but not necessarily if you're like, just writing code to do something like on a day to day basis. Is that, is that right? Or, um, I mean, I like, guess do you could also do be people, your own user. Right. Right. Like, do people actually code like this, like to just do regular stuff, like without, like, you know, I don't know, like, 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 would this, like, for some people, does this like flow out of their, you know, fingertips, like, like you would, like, regular code, or uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, know. I don't know how other people feel. Like, this feels kind of like in the same idea as like function factories a little bit, and in some cases of like more complicated object oriented coding where like, I'm not really going to design a system for myself unless it's going to really give myself, you know, give me a lot of bang for my buck, right? Like repeated use. And I think that the 
cost set up is probably more than the cost of utility in a lot of circumstances. Yeah. And I feel like it's also like kind of hard to read. Like if you were like in order to just do like, you know, obviously there's a deeper purpose to this, but in terms of representing like, uh, you know, addition to multiplication, right? Like it's, it's a lot harder to follow what you're doing if, uh, if you just, if, if you were just like, if it was just, uh, for that one case, you know, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I guess you could build functions. Like if you were building your own, um, kind of like glue, you know, you might, you might build that with, uh, like, so it understands, you know, the way your calls are built, right? Like, so you can splice in objects as well as, you know, strings and it understands what that whole call section looks like or your own version of, um, you know, regex, like if you were going to try and, you know, if you had hot codes that you might use, like that might be a way where you're you kind of, it, it, your code, you've made code that understands your code, right? So yeah, that's maybe there's some circumstance for that. Has anyone done anything like this before or encountered it in any of their work? No, not me personally. <laughs> But I'm the only person that uses R in our company, so. Does that make you invaluable then? Uh, the, <laughs> my boss would say, uh, you've got good job security. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Like if I didn't have this niche, I wouldn't <laughs> have security, so. That's what we say too. You say you can't let us go because uh, everything will break without us. Yeah. If I did a better job, then I'd be replaceable. So it's like a catch too. I haven't done much with the eval tidy, but I have been using a lot of meta programming in my package shiny objects. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a, I don't know. I, I really need to like understand all the concepts in these chapters because it's the code that's currently underneath shiny objects, I think could really benefit from from these metadata, like the Rlang methods. Um, but I'm still like just trying to trying to understand it myself. Um, but Shiny Objects like reads your R script for your a Shiny yep. app and then rewrites a lot of it so that you have access to all of your reactive objects in your local environment or your global environment. So you don't have to like keep launching your, you don't have to keep like running your your app or dashboard. You can just like debug like you would right. like, debug a script. Um, but to do that, it, it requires like reading and code, manipulating a bunch of it, and then uh, evaluating it. Interesting. So you need to understand, like, what are your foundational blocks then? Like, what are the pieces that you're trying to read as your, you know, like as an expression? Like, is it all the code one expression then? Or would you kind of try and cut it up into bits to understand each portion to be rewritten? What do you... Um, so it uses the, just like the parse function to read in the, so if it's a, if it's like a proper shiny app where you've got like a app dot or a UI dot R or, uh, an app dot R file, um, it just reads that like you would with source. Um, but if it's using like a flex dashboard framework or, or something built off of R markdown, um, it uses Perl underneath it so that's like underneath knitter so it like just it takes all of the annotation out of the r markdown and treats that as a like a dot r file um and then yeah each every line of code that the user has created is an object that i can interact with so yeah every assignment library call what have you is are all pieces of um those are like the building blocks of what i'm working with and then i'm taking a lot of those and, and rewriting them um, so that they are not reactive anymore. And uh, do you, um, is it like have to be adaptive to understand what each, I guess, I, I mean, it has to be adaptive to understand what each kind of line is roughly trying to do. Like like when it's an assignment, it knows that it's, it's an assignment or? Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's some checks where it's trying to figure out what's going on. So like, I only care about libraries, load uh, and assignments. Other than that, I don't really care. So if you just have like, you know, plot X by Y, like I, that's not something that I need to really interact with. But if you have like a reactive data frame or reactive values or something like that, 
um, you like can't debug locally or like not easily. Um, mm -hmm. So anytime I see those, I, I like rewrite, I rewrite them under the hood. So it like takes the, uh, the body and puts the body of like what you originally wrote as the arguments of a function. Like it just kind of like moves all the pieces around so that mm -hmm. uh, it is, it's stuff you can actually interact with. Um, yeah, I could, uh, I, I can share a link of kind of how it works, but um, it, it's been very tricky. <laughs> yeah. So if you were reading the capture and um, the whatever, yeah, the, the capture and, and the quoting and unquoting section. Yeah, I feel like it, that's kind of what you're and up right. You're, you're capturing pieces and but you're not really right in your sense. You're finding the right section and moving it. But that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Yeah, I don't know that I'm really doing a lot of quoting and unquoting. I'm mostly saying like I'm trying to parse out from the call. I'm still getting like all of the terms a little mixed up because there's like expressions and calls and symbols and names and I don't know all these things. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of go through through because under like it, it kind of treats it like a list so i just say like yeah. if it's in this section it's it's the body and like move that up so that it's in a different part of um yeah i, I can share uh i can yeah. share a link to the tutorial because i feel like it's a little abstract to just talk about out loud um mm -hmm. which really means i need to work on my elevator pitch um but uh but yeah but the big thing is is that uh i don't know if if you you all are are using shiny much, but there's this idea of like a, a reactive. It, you just call reactive, and so you, you say like you know like um, you know the the react my um you know like the selected department is reactive, and then inside that you say you know it's like my original data, and then filter for like some button that the user is interacting with. Um, mm -hmm. So if you try to call that, it will just say like oh you're not in reactive context, like you know, you, and it like won't give anything back. So what I do instead is I just make it a function and then I just move like all of the contents that were inside that reactive call and I make that the, the, um, the body of a, of a new function. So yeah, I just, yeah, I, I, I just move all the pieces around and then put it in the, in the environment. But I will, um, yeah, I wrote up a tutorial on like what happens under the hood so I can, I can put that in the link. Or I mean, in the chat. Well, really, I'm trying to get Hadley to include it in his book. <laughs> so that's why I wrote this up. Because um, he's, he's putting out a, a new book on debugging Shiny. That would be like a bucket list item for me. The package mentioned by Hadley. I know. I was like, you know, maybe I could be a footnote. I don't know. Well, I was like, hey, what do you think of this approach? Because it's pretty different than the other approaches I've seen. Um, and you know, like, if if you think it's interesting, like, could it maybe be a footnote? So uh, he asked me to explain a little more of like how it works. So I put this tutorial together, but I've I'm still waiting to hear back. Um, but yeah, so in this example at the top. So that's like what the user would have put in their code. And so shiny objects is gonna read, is gonna read that in and then move move the pieces around. So like the the empty cars and then I'm using the head function to, to grab like the number of rows that were selected in like a slider or something. Um, so that's like currently an argument of reactive. And so instead I like now make that the body of a, a, a new function. Um, because you would call you would call this reactive df with parentheses. So it it um, in order to like debug your code, you need to have something that like reactive underscore df with parentheses is gonna is gonna run. Um, so if you have it in the original version, it'll just say like you're not in a reactive context. Like mm -hmm. better luck next time. But as a function, you get the parentheses and it, and it returns like the manipulated data. Um, so there's a little bit. Uh, I think it talks a little bit. Um, higher up about like a dummy input object. So it does require like a slightly, a slight change to the user's workflow. Um, but yeah, so if you can just like mock up what your inputs are, so like that input dollar sign N is like, like some sort of UI element that the dashboard has, 
um, you just need to like mock up a list item and then you'll be able to, to like debug locally. But, but all of this really like would benefit from this R, the R lang methods in these, in these chapters. It's very cool. Thanks. Yeah, it's been very tricky. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, what we saw today was a yeah, cool example. Uh, the, something else that I found helpful for seeing like context for applying some of this is um, the tidy evaluation book that Hadley mentions in the chapter. And I just started reading, like just skimming it. Um, I'm just going to put the, the chat to you, sorry. Um, there's an example on that page that I shared where it's uh, there's like a, they're trying to, he's trying showing that if you want to create like a function of uh, like a, a typed like sequence and you want to pass like a variable name into the, into one of the calls in that pipe, uh, you can't just write it out from the argument in the function or else it won't find it in the um, in the mask, you have to uh, do the bang bang to like get it to realize that it's the argu function argument. Um, it's kind of hard to explain if you know, I'm not showing it, but anyway, just thought that was a useful link or useful resource. I have a question. Do you do any of you know how to if you're able to access the data under a ggplot once you've started creating the ggplot? Sometimes I'll like pipe data. I'll do like a little data manipulation and pipe that into my ggplot call. But then I want to like reference something about that data, like maybe the max date. I want to put in my, my title. I want to say like the max date is, is, is this particular date. Um, I, don't, I don't know. There's like a lot of TV noise, it sounds like. Oh, sorry. That's <laughs> I think if you wrap it in curly braces, you can access the data. Ooh, OK. Yeah. Like wrap the whole thing, like the whole ggplot call in curly braces. Don't ask me what that means. I've just done it, and then I've been able to access. Are you cool. saying in later parts of the same call though? Is that, or in a, in a separate like? Are you talking about like like you're adding to the same plot, and you want to reference the thing where your data was, or later on? Um, yeah, like I, I've done like a small pipe. So I said like MPG filter for this. And then I yeah. like pipe that right into ggplot. And then in my yeah. header, I just want to say what the maximum date was of that, yeah. of that filter. Um, mostly this is for head, headliner. The headliner. So it's like, so it's like the, you want the, the, the current state of that like manipulated data, data so frame. I, so if I were to save that object, and called it p. So if I said saved p, p would be my environment. If I did p dollar sign data, that's the data frame that I want to access to just grab. Got it. it. Got it. Yeah. I haven't done too much exploring, but I didn't know if you, you've tried this. It sounds like uh, Eric, you've maybe done this. Yeah, I'll post an example. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've always solved it by like creating a new object and then. Uh, and then referencing it. Cool. Thanks for the thanks for the sample. But I think that maybe that dot dollar sign prop is getting at what you're thinking. I don't know. Dot dollar sign. Because props like my proportion, I wanted to show it. Mm -hmm. So I access it with that. Nice. Okay. Yeah. With that dot. Interesting. Yeah, I, when I was thinking about this the other day, I thought curly braces might help, but I also wasn't sure why. <laughs> I think it's somehow creating an environment. But... Is anytime you, you use curly braces, you can do multiple steps? Is that, do you know if that's true? Wait, so, so my understanding of curly braces is that what it does is it like, if you don't use curly braces, the pipe is just going to insert whatever it was into the, as the first argument of your next function, but curly braces suppresses that behavior. Interesting. That's, that's what I, that's like, I've definitely, that's what, how I always thought it was being used to like the reason you need the ggplot 
dot comma thing is because you use the curly braces. But like, I've also seen that if you want to like to use an if, like do conditional stuff, you need curly braces around the whole thing to tell it like, yeah. But I've seen that other places too. But to come to think of it now though, Jake, or could you, couldn't you also access the current state of the data frame with dot just without the curly braces, like, like in any stage and then just do dot dollar sign the column and then wrap max around it, you know, and then just like use that in the, in the title or whatever you want. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe, maybe I can mock up a little example and we could, we could like work on it. Um, maybe we don't have to do that right now. I could put it in the um, in the Slack. But cool. Yeah, I'll take a. I'll be interesting too. Yeah. Anytime I have to do that, I just pre-calculate everything. So this sounds better. If <laughs> there's a good solution, like yeah. I got invaded. I missed. Uh, I missed. Was that braces doing anything that you were talking about? I missed the whole convo. My kids came in. Um, I'm I'm still trying it out. I think the jury's still out on the braces. Okay. Uh, okay, and then slides. Okay, so I'll put it. I'll put this example in the in the chat. I've got a random question. Um, have you guys ever like had a data frame that you wanted to break out? Like my example is, I have like uh, programs, and they have schedules, and then each. Um, program schedule has a bunch of episodes right so i want a uh, so i have a data frame with a ton of uh, programs and episodes and i i want to split it by program and then have an have export that to an excel where each tabs then a uh, each sheets a uh, schedule so i ended up having to split it twice and the second split was with map and it was just real convoluted i was wondering if you guys have and then i used open excel to, to do it but have you guys, do you guys have an elegant solution for something like that? So, so you're filtering and then pushing to Excel sheets? Yeah, okay. so then I want to have an Excel sheet for each schedule within each in each Excel sheet, Excel work. So a workbook per schedule and then within the workbooks, a sheet per um, session. And you can think of like attendance records. So it creates like a bunch of Excel workbooks. Yeah. Uh, I do that a fair amount um, because my bosses use Excel, not R. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, usually if it's filtering, I just make, like, I just kind of like write sets of loops or functions that will produce um, new sheets, right, with open um, Excel. Uh, one thing I had to do is I was trying to, um, produce lists of different potential prospects by region, but they play in different leagues. So I need to have a construct of like league to region. So I, I had to make a list for that and then loop over the regions rather than the uh, leagues themselves. So that was one kind of wrinkled, but yeah, I could, if you and I want to talk offline, I can try and help you maybe a little bit if it's uh, sweet. A yeah, that'd be awesome, Josh. So I came up with a solution, but it was pretty, it wasn't very flexible. My, my solution may be equally inflexible. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, do we have someone lined up for next week? Have we figured that out? Yeah, Jake took it. Um, anyone interested in doing the week following that? 
that would be, let's see, so 18th next week, so quasi quotation, be the week after. Are we doing it next week? Because next week is Thanksgiving, I believe, here in America. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good call. Uh, yeah, I, I will not be able to make that. So how about we do, Jake, how about we do two weeks uh, from now? For, and we just all meet in two weeks. Is that okay with everyone? Sure. Yeah, I totally forgot that's next week. Um, okay, okay. So then in three in three weeks, is someone interested in doing quasi quotation? Okay, sorry. So you're using it, Chris? Yeah, I'll try it. Volunteer. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Um, uh, all right, cool. Um, here, I tried one thing, Jake. Uh, it doesn't, like, it seems to do something, but it doesn't do what I want it to do. Uh, I thought maybe dot data would be the way to, because it's like the, uh, that's like what's passed to the aesthetic or to the ggplot function, but um, it gives me an error, non missing arguments to max. I'm curious. I'm curious if you could put the pipe after the ggplot or not. That's what I'm trying. Trying now. Let's see. Because I also think that the yeah, like once you get into the labs area where you're trying to do titles, like I don't think it's really looking at um, right. Like the aesthetics are mapped to the data, but I don't think the labs are even looking over there. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I might ask on Stack Overflow. All right, I got to run to the other book club, guys. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, y'all. Thank, thank you. Fun discussion. Yeah, great job. All right, yeah. I'll see you all. I'll see you all in uh, two weeks. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.